You are listening to the Neuro Careers podcast with Dr. K. Episode number seven. Dear listeners, welcome to the International Neuro Careers podcast, where we explore exciting career opportunities in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. Today, our podcast guest is Associate Professor Elizabeth Clark who is also a doctor of physical therapy. Dr. Clark will share with you ins and outs of becoming a physical therapist. And she also will talk about the connection between neuroscience and physical therapy. Welcome, Dr. Clark. It's a pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you for coming. Can you introduce yourself and also tell where are you located? As our podcast is international and people from all over the world are joining us. So it helps to have a sense where you are talking to us from. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk on your podcast today about the things I love, physical therapy and neuroscience. I am coming to you from Orlando, Florida, where I'm on faculty at Advent Health University. I've been a full-time faculty there for five years. Previously, I was full-time at a university in upstate New York for five years, and I've been a physical therapist since 2002. So I have more experience than I'd like to admit to, (laughs) Um, but I feel really excited to talk to your listeners today about the link between neuroscience and one of the rehabilitative options, which is physical therapy. So thank you for asking me to speak today. Thank you very much for your introduction, Dr. Clark. Let's start from the beginning. What influenced your decision to become a physical therapist? So it's really interesting. I had a love of math and science for a long time, as long as I can remember. Those have always been my favorite subjects in school. And I would say that for anyone thinking about physical therapy as a career, you should have a passion for those disciplines, math, science, and maybe even some of the psychology. But I always really loved math and science. And when I decided to go to undergrad, I was unsure of what to pick. You know, at 18 years old, it's really difficult to decide. I had every major from math major to teacher. I thought I was going to go to the Air Force. I was going to apply to medical school. I was all over the place. And I ended up deciding to be a biology major because that in my understanding at the time was going to give me a lot of opportunity to then choose. Do I want to teach science? Do I want to be a researcher? Do I want to go on for more education? And I decided, yes, I did love biology and I wanted to do more with it, but I didn't know what more. So I I did a little bit of everything as an undergraduate student. I was a research assistant in a lab that did animal research. And I was able to learn, and this was back when you had to walk to the library and use the card catalog and pull the manual off the shelf of the journal and flip the page. So that was my first experience with research was holding these binders of knowledge and information and just being so fascinated that that's how we would get information. I tried being a research technician and it was lucrative. I made a lot of money as a student, as a research tech, but I didn't love the job. I didn't feel fulfilled. I considered applying to medical school and I did an internship with a primary care physician over a summer. And I thought, I don't want to do this either. I don't want to be on call all the time. 
I don't want to have these life changing decisions that I'm making for people. It, it just overwhelmed me. And I was going into my senior year of college and I thought, oh my gosh, what the heck am I going to do? And one of my friends in school who was in school to be a speech therapist said, why don't you just come to work with me tomorrow? I work with these physical therapists. Maybe you'll like it. And she was a speech therapist in a school. And I met the physical therapist and I thought, this is like the best job ever because all we did was play with kids all day long. And I'm like, this is amazing. But what else do PTs do? I don't even know who PTs are. So I started trying to figure this out and I volunteered at a nursing home. I volunteered at an outpatient orthopedic practice. I volunteered at a brain injury rehab hospital. And that is where I'm getting like chills. That is where I knew that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. PT was so intriguing to me because I could go to school and get one degree, but I could work anywhere in the United States and I could work with any population that I wanted to. And even though I had kind of thought I wanted to work with patients with neurologic disorders, if I change my mind, I could do that. So to me, PT was intriguing because it took my love of math and science and applied it in a way where I was helping people. And it was a collaborative relationship. All of the places I volunteered, it wasn't just the PT. You were interacting with doctors and nurses and occupational therapists and speech therapists and researchers. And I thought, this is so cool to have a job where I'm surrounded by people who all have different areas of expertise and we're all trying to help people get better. That was kind of my journey. And I really fell in love with neurologic physical therapy because I saw how profound the impact could be immediately. So the hospital I volunteered at at the time that I ended up fast forward 10 years working at and supervising and managing the department was people who had a brain injury or a stroke. And those are, if you've never experienced it yourself or had a family member with it or been a therapist working with those kinds of individuals, it's totally catastrophic. You know, in an instant, people's lives are totally changed. Their role, their abilities, you know, you have an independent person who's working and is the sole provider for their family, and now they can't even feed themselves, and they can't speak, and they can't walk, and the catastrophic injuries that occur are so profound, but... The brain is like the most amazing organ in the whole body, and it has the ability to heal itself and to learn how to do new things. And I could not believe the changes that people could make after these catastrophic injuries. And I thought, I want to be a part of that. And I didn't know at the time anything about neuroplasticity or theories behind motor learning. I just knew this was something that if I did it as a job, I would make a real difference for people. And I never knew I'd be where I am now as a professor doing research and treating patients and teaching students. I never saw that, but I just knew being a neurologic physical therapy is exactly what I wanted to do. It's a beautiful story. And I think that's a very good example to those who are not sure where to go and what to do. Your suggestion is explore, try different things. And in the process of this exploration, suddenly you will feel that something is absolutely resonating with you. And for you, it was physical therapy, and you saw this possibility to help people, possibility to be connected with the amazing other specialists from different fields and do this beautiful work of helping the brain to heal itself. 
Thank you. Thank you for, for this beautiful introduction. And what did it take for you actually to become a physical therapist? Because I think in different countries, the process might be different. So how was it for you? How it is done in the United States? It's one of those examples. Yeah, you're right. The process to become a physical therapist is different in different parts of the world. In some countries, like India, for example, the program is through your college education. So it's not an advanced degree. It is that you decide that you want to do physiotherapy and you go to school for that, just like you would go to school to be a nurse. And it is one level of a degree, and you are taught how to do basic examination and evaluation of any person. So there is a similarity there with the education process in the United States in that all physical therapy schools, no matter where they're located, you are trained to be a general practitioner, just like a physician may elect to become a family medicine practitioner. They know a little bit about everything, but there are also physicians who specialize in gastroenterology or neurology or oncology. So physical therapy education in the United States is, is similar in that you have a general education. At this point in time, and this changed around, two, I would say, 2010, the goal from the American Physical Therapy Association had been that all programs would become doctoral level by 2020. But when they made this announcement early on in the early 2000s, most of the programs were like, well, we're not going to wait. We're just going to transition now. So I started a doctoral program for physical therapy in 2005. This was after I completed four years of a bachelor's degree. And at the time, I had already completed three years of a graduate program to be a physical therapist. So I had kind of a longer route. Mm -hmm. The path now for a student would be that you do very well and are accelerated in math and science in your high school, that you get an undergraduate degree in anything that you want, but there are a lot of prerequisites for physical therapy schools that include math and science. So you don't have to be a math or science major, but you do have to take a lot of science and some psychology-based courses that usually lend themselves well to you being like a biology major, a kinesiology major, exercise science as a major. Most of those undergraduate degrees have embedded in them a lot of these prerequisites that PT schools require. The entry-level degree at this point in time in the United States for a physical therapist is a doctoral degree. So all PTs graduating in the U.S. have a four-year bachelor's degree and then complete three years of education that get them to the doctoral level. And that doctoral level education includes usually at least I think it's 42 to 48 weeks of clinical, full-time clinical work. That's part of your education. It includes a research, kind of a capstone project, and then all of the courses you take. So it's not a decision to make lightly because you're looking at seven years of education after high school. And then you graduate as a general physical therapist. Many people then decide they want to specialize. So if you want to specialize in pediatric, geriatric neurology, you can do that in a couple of ways. You can apply for and attend a residency program, which are typically one year in length, and that helps you specialize in an area of treatment. You can just seek to be employed in a clinical setting that helps you specialize in that area and then do your own continuing education to become board certified in a specialty area if you choose. So it's not required. 
To be a physical therapist, you complete your education. You have to pass a licensure exam, and then you can work. And in the United States, every state has a different requirement for licensure renewal as it pertains to continuing education. So as a physical therapist, you have to love learning because you'll be required to do it for the rest of your life. You have to do anywhere from probably 20 to 40 hours of continuing education every time you go to renew your license. So there is a requirement that the profession is always learning and always trying to move forward. So that being said, it could be a pretty big financial investment and time investment to seek to become a licensed physical therapist. What was the most challenging part on your journey of becoming a physical therapist? I think for me, the most challenging part was the length of time. So four years of undergrad plus three years of graduate school seems to me to be a very large investment of time. And the physical therapy graduate school typically starts in May and is year round for three years. So if you think that most students finish their undergraduate education in April or May, and then you decide you're going to go to grad school and you're accepted, sometimes you only have a weekend off. Sometimes you have a couple of weeks off. So for me, I found that to be the most challenging in that I finished four years of school. I had a weekend and I started grad school. And in hindsight, maybe a deferral for a year would have given me just a little more time and space to explore some other things. I'm not saying it would have changed my mind or my path, but I thought that was the most challenging was the intensity of the time commitment to actually fulfill my goal to become a physical therapist. As far as I know, just becoming a doctor of physical therapy, it wasn't enough for you. And you also studied leadership. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? And what uh, prompted you to also explore that path? Yeah, it's kind of a joke in my family that my dad, when I was little, had said to me, you know, as many parents do, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I kind of thought about it and I said, I just think I want to be a student because I love to learn. And my dad's like, that sounds expensive. (laughs) (laughs) Because in his mind, that meant school and school and school. And he's looking at these tuition bills like, please stop going to school. But no, I, I love learning, honestly. And so... I graduated from PT school in 2002 with a master's degree. And after practicing for about three years, and I'd been in neurologic physical therapy that entire time, I did pursue a residency program. So the the hospital and the health organization I worked for wanted to establish one. And I was really motivated to participate. So I was kind of the guinea pig for the residency program. And I worked with the academic partner as well as our clinical team to develop the residency program. And then I was the resident for the first year. So I rotated through all of our different clinical areas, acquiring hours of patient care and experiences simultaneously the university I graduated from, because as I mentioned, everyone was transitioning to a doctoral degree, was offering for its graduates, I think it was 13 or 16 credits that would bridge the gap from your master's to your doctoral degree. So at the time I did the residency program, I did the transitional doctoral program. We then started the residency program. So I was really enjoying the clinic and was treating patients all the time. I ended up having my son in 2010 and becoming a mom changed a lot of my priorities. And I had an extended maternity leave. I was fortunate 
in that my employer had found me to be a very important and appreciated employee. And I guaranteed to them that I would definitely come back. And I had all sorts of coverage set up. So I had four months off, which is really unheard of in the United States. But I went back to work the first day and I thought, oh, that's that's great. And then I got up the second day and I thought, oh, no, I can't do this for forever. I can't get up every single day and leave my little child. And I just really was like, what do I do? I love PT, but I love being a mom. How do I do both? And I quickly realized I really, I personally could not stay as the manager of a clinic, as the co-director of a residency program. I couldn't do that and be a mom, which was my new number one priority. I started looking at other options and ended up taking a clinical faculty position at a university. It just had so much more flexibility, which is a new mom I really wanted. It allowed me to work from home at least one day a week. That decision really propelled me in a different direction where I could do physical therapy at our clinic. I could teach physical therapy as a lab assistant, but I also felt really supported as a mom. Making that transition to becoming a faculty then, I was clueless about what it meant to be a faculty. I just knew how to be a clinician. I realized after I had been doing that for probably three years, I thought if I want to really be a better teacher, because I was never trained to be a teacher, I was trained to be a clinician, which has a teaching component, but I thought I would like to be immersed in this a little bit more so I could be even better at it. I'd like to be better at research. I actually had some questions at that point that I wanted to answer. So, yes, I enrolled in a doctoral program that was in executive leadership. And that program worked out really well because it was meant for people that work full time. So class met Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, every other weekend. And I could manage that and be a mom and do my job. I just was really excited about that opportunity that PT education looks for people who have a really diverse set of skills. So in order for me to train a future physical therapist, I can't just be a physical therapist. It's better if you're a physical therapist with a specialty And it's even better if you're a physical therapist with a doctoral degree in something that's not PT, because you just bring more diversity to the classroom. You bring more opportunity for research and scholarship, and it then allows faculty that have all different kind of areas of expertise to contribute to the future generation of therapists. And that's beneficial in the long run to the patients that we try to help. That was what led me down that road of, as my dad would say, more bills and being more of a student. <laughs> <laughs> but also to more opportunities for your career development. Yes. yes. How was your fascination with the brain and neuroplasticity developing throughout that time? My fascination with the brain, neuroplasticity, this idea of how we could implement and these possibilities, you know, I had seen it in patients. When you work with patients, I didn't know why they were getting better. I didn't know why necessarily their walking was better, their talking was better, their balance was better. And I thought, well, I certainly don't have some kind of magic touch that's making this happen. How is this happening? And a lot of it is this interdisciplinary approach that we have in physical rehabilitation and medicine, and particularly, I think, in the area of neurology, that I was working with people who had areas of expertise that were complementary but different, occupational therapists, speech therapists, nurses, neuropsychologists, neuropsychometrists physicians, physiatrists, neurologists, and 
everyone was using their expertise, but come to find out what we were all doing was facilitating patient access to repeating tasks that were salient and doing things in a goal-driven manner and activating their bodies in a way that was stimulating parts of the brain that had been damaged from an injury. And all of that combined was facilitating this neurophysiology to promote growth and change in the brain. And I have always found that to be overwhelmingly fascinating. And I've seen it firsthand in patients who have catastrophic injuries that they should not survive. And not only do they survive, but they relearn how to walk and talk and go back to work. And the brain is just full of so many possibilities that I really love what I do because it combines my love of science with my desire to help people and my willingness to work with other clinicians and people with other areas of expertise to apply these theories of motor learning and see neuroplasticity happen. And that still fascinates me to this day because I think the more time goes on, the more we learn, the more we understand, the better we're able to refine our interventions. And so I enjoy working in a field that requires me to keep learning and where things are continuously changing. The technology that we use to understand the injury has changed. The MRIs and functional MRIs and CT scans and the way we understand injury is different. And that also has kind of trickled down into some of the interventions that we do, that we use sometimes computer-based technology or, you know, we really just focus with people on what motivates them to move and tap into that to facilitate their recovery. It's fascinating to me every day, really. Can you share maybe the most fascinating case in your practice where you saw those amazing capabilities of the nervous system of the brain to restructure itself, to heal itself, and how maybe the use of physical therapy facilitated that process? I can think of a couple of patients. One, he was a young man who was new, maybe a couple of years, police officer. And he and uh, his team had responded to a call and they were encountered a young man at the home. He was a minor who was causing a disturbance and that was why the neighbors had called and so they had responded to that and he was a pretty angry young man so they had talked to him and were turning to go and as the police officers turned to leave the young man had a gun and he shot at the police officers and the patient that I ended up having he was shot in the head So his colleagues literally grabbed him, threw him in the back of their car, drove across the city to take him to the hospital where, by the grace of God, the best neurosurgeon in town was on call. And he saved the man's life. And this young man, when he woke up from his uh, surgery, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't walk. He could speak, but with great difficulty. He had an extraordinary amount of pain. Consider the force and the velocity at which a bullet would exit a weapon and enter your brain. I believe that there was a a significant uh, whiplash injury as well to his neck. He had limited cervical mobility, couldn't sit up, couldn't feed himself. Because of the area of the brain that was damaged, It was almost as if he presented with a stroke because half of his body didn't work. The left arm, the left leg, the left side of his face was all 
incapable of, of working or doing anything. So when you suddenly lose that ability, you can't roll in bed, you can't take yourself to the bathroom, you can't sit up, you can't walk. So he was very debilitated when I started working with him. And he ended up making the most amazing recovery. He left the facility walking with a quad cane, using a brace on his foot and ankle. He had a brace to hold his arm up. But he continued to improve over time to a point where he still wore the brace but didn't need an assistive device. He didn't use a cane. He was no longer allowed to have a service weapon, but he did return to work more of like a desk job with the police department. And it just was so inspirational to me that this young man had made such a significant progress and improvement when I saw the image of his brain and where the bullet had gone and where part of it remained. And there can be no other explanation for a person's recovery than well, maybe divine intervention, but also this concept that something changed in there because there are areas that will no longer work the same as they did before. So to see him recover and to see his perseverance and his dedication was really inspiring, but again, just reinforced my love of what I did and my desire to understand neuroplasticity more and to want to know what should I do? How often should I do it? When should I do it? How intense should I do it? Because I wanted to help people like him get back to their life. So he was probably one of the most overwhelming in lots of ways, but amazing patients that I had. Yeah, and I'm sure that there were many others that you helped and it again reinforced your interest in the brain, neuroscience, neuroplasticity. Mm. And uh, probably this is what also facilitated you to start teaching neuroscience to students. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. And also, what angle of neuroscience do you emphasize for students in physical therapy? I'm sure that there is a certain emphasis on things when you are teaching neuroscience to physical therapy students? Yeah, so I would say you're right. Because of my area of expertise in practice, that lended itself well for me to learn how to teach that to entry-level people. So what I had been trained to do and what I was good at was helping people after an injury. What I had to learn how to do was, how do I teach other people how to do that? That was something that took time. I had some really good mentorship when I was first starting of people who had more teaching experience than me, because I wouldn't even have known how to create a syllabus or how to write a three-hour lecture. What do you do in lab for four hours? Like That, to me, was really difficult, but I quickly realized I just have to teach them how to do the things that I do without thinking about it. And so to try to like take what's happening in your brain and get it out on a piece of paper was actually really a fun process for me and forced me to really review and understand the anatomy and the physiology and the pathophysiology that occurs with any of these neurologic diagnoses that I treat. And to articulate what do I do and how do I help these people. And so there are some important theories that we know that exist. We call them theories of motor learning. There are ways in which you learn something when you're born and you go through a typical course of development. There are typical motor milestones that occur and those occur because of the way that your built-in reflexes initially allow you to interact with the environment, but then you become much more goal-driven in your behavior 
And that structures how you develop and how you move. And so from what we know about a typical pediatric development, we can kind of take some of those concepts as well as some of the concepts that we use in athletes. So think about the best basketball player that you know, the best golfer, the best tennis player, the best swimmer. They are good at it because they do it nonstop. They practice intensely, frequently, even when they're not physically doing the task, they're doing it in their mind. They're replaying how they do the free throw. They're replaying how they use their driver to hit the ball. They're replaying that flip turn at the end of the pool lane. So we take what we know about when children develop and what we know about athletes that just get really, really good and fine-tuned at things. And we kind of combine that in neuroscience. And the theories of motor learning that we talk about include things like repetition of activity, salient activities, this concept of either you use it or you lose it, right? Like you have to do an activity and you have to be focused and you have to get good at it or your body's going to be not good at it, right? So there are these kind of central concepts then that apply to the theory of motor learning that we have come through imaging and outcome measures and research to know that is what drives neuroplasticity because when you do those things in a prescriptive way that is tailored to that individual, they get better. And the only way they get better is not because you magic wand healed their brain that didn't have blood flow to it or that it had a bullet go through it or that has plaque that are developing in it, it's because there's other physiology in the brain that you help promote an environment for it to grow and heal and change. And so I think it, what I like about neuroscience and what I like about teaching neuroscience is my students don't have to love neuro patients because every human being has a brain and every human being better at doing an activity because of these principles of neuroscience. So you could love pediatrics or geriatrics or sports medicine or neuro. It doesn't matter. What I have to teach you is valuable because the concepts apply no matter the person that you hope to work with. So that's the other thing I love about neuroscience is all of my students actually have to be good at it whether they like it or not. (laughs) (laughs) I try to acknowledge this and I try to help them see how no matter what they want to do, this information is important. Thank you. When you were talking, you mentioned the practicing certain things in people's mind. Uh, people, uh, People who are athletes, for example, they can perform both physical activity and also do the practice in their own mind. Mm -hmm. And this is a very interesting concept that uh, we know that even imagining certain things, certain activities can activate sensory motor cortex. And this brings me to the fascinating project that uh, you started doing, uh, the project with the brain-computer interfaces. And before I ask you to talk about it, I just want to uh, tell listeners about something that really fascinates me in you. It's your persistence. No matter what, you are persevering step by step, but you are doing and doing and doing. How I know about that is from interaction with you. As I worked with the brain imaging in the hospital settings with magnetoencephalography, brain-computer interfaces, electrocarticography in brain surgery, 
I had many people who wanted to collaborate. Some of the people come, they want to collaborate, but somebody doesn't follow up. Somebody doesn't have time later. However, when you came and you said that you want to collaborate in this field of physical therapy and brain computer interfaces, you followed up, you came again, you started working together on the project. And so far, we already released, I think, second article together. Many students have completed the projects under our guidance. I think that quality of really being persistent in what you do, it uh, leads to a tremendous success. Your persistence always helped me when I thought it's already impossible to get all those IRB approvals and everything else but you said okay we can do it <laughs> then okay <laughs> let's let's do it we will move forward i just wanted to acknowledge it and i think it's very helpful to talk about qualities like this to students so that they really would have this in mind so maybe you can comment on this specifically to students and then, of course, already tell listeners about this project and brain-computer interfaces, what have you done and why it interests you and maybe what are your future plans about, about it. Well, thank you so much for the acknowledgement. And the, I think perseverance is something that is demonstrated by people, not necessarily always on purpose. I don't wake up every day and think, oh, I'm just going to persevere no matter what. <laughs> Some days I wake up and I'm like, oh, God, again, I have to do this thing or I have this problem or whatever. I don't know. I guess I just think everything seems hard at first. So just do a little bit, right? Just take a little piece. Just start a little part. And then you realize every task can be broken down into smaller pieces and I can do a small thing. So mm -hmm. I'm very goal-driven and very eye on the prize kind of focus, but I don't let that distract me from the little things that I could do right now. And so I try to break things down into manageable parts. And I think that's important for someone who wants to pursue physical therapy as a career because it's very difficult. You have to be very good in your undergraduate program and have specific prerequisites with a certain GPA and do well on an interview to be accepted to school. And then school is really hard and it's three years straight and it's nonstop. And then after that, you still have to take a licensure exam. Like that is a daunting task if you actually look at it. You just have to take it one little piece at a time. And I would say the other probably two things are, so one is for perseverance for me is break it down into small pieces. But I'd say the other two things are, I have great faith and I just trust this process and the journey that I'm on. I don't depend on my earthly human brain to understand what's happening, but I trust that there's a higher power and I'm in the right place at the right time for the right reason. I don't believe in coincidences. I think I've met the right people for the right reasons at the right time. And I, I just try to keep my eyes open to those possibilities and I stay focused on my faith in that way. And then I think the final thing is I have to also realize I don't know everything and I would never want to know anything. That's too big of a responsibility. So the other way that I think persevering is manageable is you have to reach out to get help and you have to depend on other people who have experience and expertise in other areas that by working together, you can then mutually achieve goals. So I think part of persevering is networking. Part of it is taking a leap of faith. Part of it is working hard, 
Yeah. So that just kind of led you and I to work together on a project that I didn't really know anything about when we started. I always have thought using technology and physical therapy is fascinating and is a good idea and is motivating to some patients. And that's part of motor learning is it's got to be motivating and it should be something that, you know, people are excited about. I wanted to learn about technology and what we've then come to learn together in working on our research over the past few years is that there is technology that can help a person achieve motor rehabilitation. And we don't exactly know why or how or the specifics behind all of it. So I can't say, okay, Melena, use this piece of equipment for 32 minutes a day, do this exact kind of tactile or verbal feedback, and then in 14 weeks, you'll be better. Like, I don't know that. But what I do know from the literature is there is equipment that generates for some individuals after a stroke in particular, an environment in which they're engaged, they're excited, they're driven to meet a goal, they get just the right amount of feedback from the intervention and the therapist that they're working with, that they start to make improvements and gains and meet their goals. And I don't think that we should ever look for the one thing that's going to fix everyone, but I think we need to look for things that help people for whatever reason. So I think this technology is one of those really fascinating things that there's a lot of theories about why this does work and why it should work and how we should use it. But there's still a lot we don't yet know about like the dosage of it. How much should someone do it? How long should they do it? How long do their improvements last? How do we know that they've improved? What specific outcomes are we measuring so we know that they've improved? What's the secret sauce with this BCI thing that affords a person neuroplasticity you know is it time is it the task is it the feedback is like what is it so I think to me that's that's fascinating and the other thing I I like about this equipment is that for many people so the physical therapist I mostly work with patients on their mobility as it relates to standing and walking and all of the things that relate to that And that's a goal for every human being from the moment we're born, we try to move. And once we start walking, we never stop. So that's an easy goal, honestly, to work on with people. But the harder thing, and sometimes the more devastating thing that people lose after a stroke is hand function. And I think that we've really thought over time the the best way to try to rehabilitate that. And the challenge with the hand is that, is this part of your body that just has to function all by itself in space and be able to have fine motor grip and grasp and control. And you get feedback from your hand once you successfully interact with something. But your leg, you could be like the clumsiest fool on the planet, but your whole foot's still on the ground and you're still getting all that weight bearing through your leg. So the leg is, I think, so much easier to rehabilitate because we're giving it input all the time. The hand is much harder and it's much more devastating when people lose that function. So I think this technology is fascinating to me because it provides people an opportunity in the protocol that you and I are familiar with to utilize the hand and the upper extremity to try to help that improve. And I think that's an area where many of my patients have great frustration and want to continue to see improvement. So I think if we can find the right prescription as it relates to how to use this equipment, it can be extremely valuable for people in their rehabilitation. And it is promoting neuroplasticity. That's what's affording these changes. So I think 
that's something that's important for me to continue to try to understand. And where will the project go? I don't know. I mean, I think we've had some challenges in that this is really complicated equipment. Even just your your laptop needs updates and, and hardware and software adjustments. And so magnify that by a thousand when you're talking about this sensitive equipment. So learning how to use the equipment, maintaining the equipment is challenging. Learning how the research contributes to a protocol was challenging. Learning all of the outcome measures that we were going to use that were informed by the literature was time consuming. And you, if you're like, okay, I'm finally ready to go. And we, we jumped through all these hoops and hurdles. Let's start the study. And then hello, COVID-19. And we could do no research and we could recruit no subjects and we have no patients. So again, we just are persevering. And despite all of that, we still have published two papers. We still have mentored. We're on our third group of doctoral students who are engaged in this project with us. And we will finally be ready in the next six months to actually have patients use this. And it's so exciting to me to be able to still be on this journey with you and to still be able to think about how are we going to make a difference for people and how is this opportunity for us to do research and mentor students, but more importantly, how are we going to make a difference for these humans? That's really exciting to me. And Despite all the challenges, I'm still looking forward to being able to implement it. Absolutely. It will happen. No matter what, (laughs) we will be persevering. Talking about the use of technology in rehabilitation, how do you see the future of physical therapy and the use of technology? Maybe... 20 years from now? I mean, I think all fields are going to use technology more. You know, one example is some of the interventions that we think about. So this BCI technology is one. There's a lot of use of different kinds of accelerometers. So your Apple Watch has an accelerometer in it that gives you information and tracks your activities. That's something that we can capitalize on when we're trying to get people to move and exercise and understand their health and wellness. I think that's a great value of technology because I think healthcare in the United States is lacking in prevention methods. We're really good at after you have a problem, we'll prescribe you medication and we'll do these tests. And we have ridiculous technologies when it comes to life-saving procedures. But we really kind of stink at helping you avoid all these problems in the first place. I think where technology could be really helpful is helping people do a better job of tracking their activity, their diet, their blood pressure, their heart rate, their mobility, so that you're just better informed about your body so that I could help you learn more about yourself and your body so you could avoid being injured. So there's still value and need for someone like me who's educated in that area, but I'd rather be able to spend time helping you learn how to avoid a problem than spending time and resources helping you rehabilitate. So I think that's one area that hopefully in the next 20 years, we can capitalize on technology to to do a better job of prevention. And then I also think technology just gives us great opportunity to be connected to people. So we saw during the pandemic when people weren't able or didn't want to actually go places, much more of a desire for telehealth. So being able to virtually see a patient and talk them through activities or exercises or assessing their home. So being able to provide that as a valued service. So I think that's another area that rehabilitation could expand in is how can we be better with telehealth and use technology for that. And then I also think that there is, there is literature that does also suggest that 
a lot of our rehabilitation could be improved with virtual reality. So let's say I'm trying to rehabilitate a patient who's had an amputation because he wants to use his prosthesis well to walk his daughter down the aisle, right? It'd be awesome if I had a virtual environment where I could actually practice like the different kind of surface that he may be on, the, the different kind of environmental components that he might experience. You know, there's a lot of things I just can't recreate in a clinic that virtual reality could, I think, benefit patients in our quest for rehabilitation. So you still have to take it out of the computer into the world, but the computer, I think, technology could give us just some other opportunities to help people have some more experiences that help them in their rehabilitation. And I hope there's a million other things I don't even think about right now, because if I know the answer, then that's not a good evolution of technology. Like, I hope the technology we're using in 20 years, I can't even comprehend at this moment. I hope it changes that much. <laughs> let's hope, let's hope that we'll have surprises along the way. That's always fun. <laughs> Very good. Also, in this podcast, we are talking about some ways for people, for professionals, students to deal with the, their stress, with their overwhelm. How do you deal with the situations like this when you get overwhelmed with the, all your work and teaching and, of course, being a mom? What helps you and maybe some approaches that you can recommend to the students? So a couple of things help me. I have a really great support network. So I have uh, my parents, my boyfriend, my close friends. I just have people who, you know, they're like your family and you have your friends that are your family. And so I think having a support network of people who you can be really honest with how you're feeling and how you're doing and what is happening, that is really important. So going beyond superficial friendships with people, having people that you really can kind of like bear your heart and soul to and they still want to talk to you the next day, that's important to find. So I think actual human connection is helpful. You know, my faith is really helpful. It helps me to know that I'm this stumbling, fumbling human that is probably going to get it wrong a lot. But when I keep my focus on sort of like the bigger picture and a higher power, it, that helps me to just trust this journey that I'm on. And in the things that help me sort of like feel better are exercise related. I love to run. I love to be outside and have fresh air and just breathe in Florida in June, almost July. It's like humid and sultry and hot and like I love it. I love to feel that nature. And I spend a lot of time learning about and practicing yoga as well. I did a 200 hour yoga teacher training in 2019. That helped me to just be reminded about some of the yoga philosophy and principles about linking your movement to your breath is like really actually a helpful concept in life that helps you control your breathing. And the other yoga concept I think that helps me is to understand that you can pause and you can take a break and you don't have to do every single thing that the yoga instructor is saying. Like they empower you in every class, like, Hey, you want to take it up a notch, go ahead, but you want to take it down and you can do that too. And that's a good life lesson like you're feeling good and you are in the zone you should do more but if your body and mind are telling you it's too much you should take a break I think for me my sort of way to balance is one to just be willing to acknowledge I'm not always going to get it right and I have to be patient with myself and give myself grace 
but also to have some actual strategies that help me, my family, my faith, and the forms of exercise that for me actually make me feel better. And I think there was a quote that I read recently. It said something about you should spend a half an hour outside every single day, unless you're too busy, then you should spend an hour. <laughs> I was like, yep, exactly. Because you know what you need? You need to chill out and just breathe in some oxygen. And I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. And I want to tell our listeners that you also were trying to help people during pandemic by posting some yoga related videos on YouTube. Oh, yeah. And I utilized them not during pandemic, but now actually to help myself to yes. feel better after sitting hours and hours at the desk. And that was wonderful. I was demonstrating all my family members, the cactus <laughs> pose. I can say that just doing a little bit, just, you know, a couple of minutes of exercise, I gained at least 15% of energy back. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. thank you so much for, for doing that, for sharing this. Yeah, and I think it's different for everyone. You know, for some people, it's, it's dancing. For some people, it's listening to music. For some people, it's yoga. But I think everyone just has to find your thing. For me, yoga does really help because what it actually makes you do is slow down and be attentive to your posture and your breathing, which is the source of many physiologic ailments that we have is being out of alignment and not paying attention to our cardiorespiratory status. So it's so simple, but I just love the concept. And, and the other thing that I also like and want people to know, I guess, about yoga is it doesn't have to be done in super expensive, fancy, dancy outfit in a studio, like for this hour long class. You could be at home in your pajamas and do it for five minutes. You could sit and meditate on a cushion in a closet because your family's driving you bonkers and you feel amazing in a few <laughs> minutes. So like, I just want people to know that yoga is so accessible and does not require fancy clothes, fancy equipment, fancy spaces or a lot of time. And like you're saying, I feel the same way. It, in a short period of time, if I can carve out even like 15 minutes to do a quick flow and a little shavasana, like I feel so amazing for the rest of the day. I'm like, oh, who cares if I have 17 more meetings today? I could do it, you know? And I've been doing it with my son too. I try at least once a week that we do yoga together and I kind of walk him through some stuff and he'll, he'll let me know after that he feels amazing and relaxed and like he's at peace and I'm like yeah buddy this is it this is what we need <laughs> that's wonderful our podcast is called Neuro Careers doing the impossible what would be your suggestion to students or to those who are changing maybe their careers and thinking of some things as being impossible how to make them possible. I think it kind of goes back to what we talked about before is this idea of perseverance. And perseverance isn't something that you have to know how to do. It's not something that you enjoy. It's not something that you're, you want to be good at. Usually people persevere because like terrible things have happened to them or, or they have some overwhelming situations and you're like, oh, you're so strong. You're so this, you're so that. It's like people don't necessarily get like that because they want to be. They get like that because that's what life has presented them. So I think when you're faced with a situation that seems impossible, like, is it? Is it really impossible? Like no one on the face of the earth has ever done that before. I don't know. And if that is the case, wouldn't it be cool if you were the first? So I would say don't, don't see life challenges as 
roadblocks necessarily, see them as an opportunity to learn. And maybe what you learn is that is a bad path and I'm not going to go down it. Or that was a bad choice and I shouldn't have made it. But maybe you learn something else about yourself or your life. And I think breaking things down into small, manageable tasks is helpful. Have that end goal. Do the work. Don't just wait for some miracle to befall you, but put it into small things that you can do and share your goals with people that believe in you and inspire you and maybe can help you in some way. I think that helps you, quote unquote, do the impossible. I hope that inspires people and makes them feel uplifted and like they could do it. I'm sure it will. Absolutely. At the end of our conversation, maybe you can share some information how to contact you, how to find out more about the research you are doing. If somebody wants to ask you questions or learn about your research, what would be the easiest way to do that? Yeah, I think the easiest way is probably email. My email is really easy. It's just my name, Elizabeth, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H dot Clark, C-L-A-R-K, at A-H-U dot E-D-U. So A is in Apple, H is in Harry, U is in University, E is in Edward, D is in Dog, U is in University. So Elizabeth dot Clark at A-H-U dot E-D-U. That's the easiest way. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. We will also add this information to our podcast notes so that people can find your contact information. I want to thank you for this amazing podcast. Uh, It was a great pleasure talking to you. I'm sure our listeners will find this conversation very helpful. I wish you all possible success in all your future endeavors and uh, looking forward to meeting you in our future podcast and see how the path of uh, utilizing technology for rehabilitation is unraveling for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it.